Welcome to Channel's Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, I'll be having an exclusive sit-down with Dave Uduwanu, the managing director of Sigma Pensions. Nigeria's pension fund administrators performed pretty well during the COVID-19 pandemic, fueling the sentiment that pension funds are the key to unlocking Africa's infrastructure funding. I'll be speaking with him about that and more later on in the show. And later, broadcaster and Africa analyst Tamzan Kajo will be joining me to discuss Ethiopia's deadly civil war that is fast becoming a large-scale humanitarian crisis. But now, over to our first topic, Brexit. As the clock ticks down to the end of the transition period, KPMG, one of the big four accounting firms, has forecast that Britain's acrimonious divorce from its European neighbours could cut tens of billions of pounds from economic growth next year hampering the UK's recovery from the deepest downturn on record. The report comes amidst a critical juncture in ongoing negotiations. Earlier this week, European Commission Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis said the bloc is now in the final push to secure a trade and security agreement with Britain. Progress has been blocked by disagreements over post-Brexit fishing rights and common standards, including state aid rules. For a spokesperson, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that if the country cannot find a suitable compromise with our European friends, we'll be leaving the transition period on Australia-style terms on January the 1st. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by our business correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, here we are again. Any break for negotiations? Nope. Let's finish it there. No, there hasn't been um, there hasn't been much progress. There's been no breakthrough, and as the weeks tick away, and we keep sitting here talking about it, it's getting harder and harder for any kind of deal to be ratified. So, um, the the main news, I guess, out um, in the last few days has been that the ECB, the European Central Bank, says that any banks within Europe that want to continue to bank in Europe need to leave London. Now, this was always a thing that um, Euro skept- um, that the pro Euro people said would happen at the. That London is a very big financial banking institution, that a lot of banks are going to have to get up and leave. And the ECB this week has come out and said, don't use coronavirus as an excuse not to move your headquarters to Europe. So that's one thing which is obviously quite worrying because London's been known for its banking for decades and it looks like it may lose that status. Good news, I guess, for the government here is that France seems to have blinked first in this whole fisheries thing. Um, A lot of sort of um, pro-Brexit papers here saying a victory for Britain over Europe in terms of the fisheries um, debacle but that is still um, very much a sticking point. Um, the Irish Foreign Secretary, um, Simon Coveney, says that um, trade talks um, will be in real trouble if there isn't a, a breakthrough this week. So in the next seven days, nothing happens, then it's in real trouble. We've been there before, of course. Boris saying um, uh, he still wants a deal, but he is sure that um, Britain will be um, prospering um, despite uh, no deal. He's been saying that for a long time. You know, the whole sort of patriotic, come on, Britain, we can do this without the EU, if that's kind of game playing and trying to pretend that he doesn't care about getting a deal, who knows? Obviously, we now know that Joe Biden is the president of the United States. That makes it more important for Britain to get a deal with Europe because it's hard to know where Joe Biden really stands on Britain and any trade deal um, with the UK. We obviously know that Donald Trump really was sort of pros- was really sort of talking up um, the possibility of having a deal with the UK, and it would be a glorious deal, it would be a big deal. But I don't think Joe Biden's quite um, quite as keen on that. Um, and just a reminder of the sticking points that we have: that is um, access um, that EU boots, boats should have to UK fishing waters, and also state aid. And the latter means that um, if a company is in trouble, the government here wants to be able to help out a, a company in trouble, a privately listed company. Whereas um, in Europe, that's not allowed. So those are the main main sticking points. And really, yeah, we need to have some kind of progress before we sit here next week for there to be any chance of a deal being ratified by the 31st of December. Simon, let's see if there's any breakthrough next week. Thank you once again. Now over to our next topic. Pension reform and pension funds are a topic of much discussion in Africa, especially considering how well pension fund administrators fared during the COVID-19 pandemic. As part of efforts to support financial sector development on the continent, there are growing calls for nations to use private pension funds to support private sector development, as well as the investment in infrastructure and social services that is so desperately needed to drive continued growth and transformation in Africa. Well, for more on this topic, I'm now being joined in Lagos, Nigeria, by Dave Uduwanu, the Managing Director and CEO of Sigma Pensions, a portfolio company of Actis, one of the leading private equity investors on the African continent. Dave Uduwanu, thank you so much for joining me on Channel's Business Global. My goodness, what a roller coaster 
of a year it's been. COVID-19 has wrecked havoc across many sectors, but there have been some winners. And according to data compiled uh, by Pension Nigeria, no PFA had a negative return on investment year to date. How's the industry survived the economic fallout of COVID? Thanks. Thanks, Juliana. Um, so the, the, the pension industry has done relatively well this year. A um, couple of things has helped the industry. One, we've seen a stock market rally, which has gone from negative last year to 30% year to date um, on the back of a reduced interest rate by the central bank. Now, on the back of that reduced interest rate, bond yields have declined from the highs of 14% to as low as 4% and sub 1% in the treasury bill market. Um, that obviously has meant that the capital gains, PFEs have booked huge capital gains on their bond portfolio. And finally, we have quite a bit of health to maturity bonds, which is anchored at 14% to run at 20 years. So a combination of these three things have meant that even though the pandemic has dragged havoc globally, it's been a good year for the pension industry. And I dare say the industry will end with better return this year than it did in the last five years. It, it, it has been a good year for you. And of course, because of just the nature of COVID, it has really changed the culture of workplaces, particularly with investment. How has things modified or, uh, you know, changed the way you invest? Um, so we've had to change our strategy to move from, you know, a concentration on government bonds to other asset classes. Um, what the first one is equities, we've increased our equity allocation um, and also allocation to alternative investments. We've invested in um, a couple of um, commodity driven products like new gold ETF, which tends to do well when markets are not doing well. And finally, we are looking at investing in private equity and infrastructure if we find assets that are, are well prime for this environment. So we've had to rotate away from fixed income securities in, at this time. You said, just going back slightly, Dave, it, it, you know, of course, it has been a, a pretty successful year, one, one of probably the, the best years on record since you've uh, been at Sigma. But were there nerves when, you know, COVID first uh, took a grip? You know, I think here in Britain, it was March. Were, were there Was there a period of time when you were concerned? Yes, the first two months, the market actually went down. A um, couple of things happened. The central bank dropped, started dropping interest rate. But I think the where we're most concerned was on the currency market. The Naira, the local currency, uh, moved from something like lost about 25% in, in a matter of two months um, on the back of reduced oil prices. We're very concerned because revenues of government dipped and the ability to, to, to serve the FX market also dipped. And we're particularly concerned also about government ability to to meet debt service obligation. And finally, the social impact of COVID, which led, has led to, even though it wasn't directly related, but I've led to some riots in some places because people are just not able to feed. And Nigerian government doesn't have the fiscal space to offer, offer money, financial aid to businesses and individuals. Actis, an international private equity firm, invested in Sigma Pensions in 2015, taking a majority stake. What has that investment done for Sigma and for the Nigerian people in general? The, the investment has been good for Sigma, and we see private equity as a force for good if well structured and utilized. Actis came in and took a majority stake and brought in a top management team. The management team was also aligned with Actis because they bought shares in the company. The company has been transformed. We embarked on a five-year transformation journey that is anchored on modernization and digital transformation. We brought in a lot of people, and we have created what is a modern technology-driven um, pension fund business. We've created significant shareholder value. Asset under management has grown, and profit is growing. So I think that well-structured, private equity is a force for good, especially for businesses that are slightly mature like Sigma and in stabilized sectors like financial services investing alongside an experienced management team. Alignment is important for private equity, where you don't have alignment between the private equity firm and the management team or the founder, you tend to have problems. And I think that's one of the reasons why we, sometimes we see in the media private equity being criticized. But I, I think that overall, for experienced practitioners like ourselves, private equity is a good source of financing because beyond capital, they also add value to the business. 
Absolutely. I'm sure many of our uh, viewers would agree with you. I've got to ask because I'm sitting in London and it wouldn't be fair if I don't ask this question. I believe earlier this week the UN did mention that uh, COVID-19 is likely to push 100 million people into extreme poverty. And we know that uh, pensions are supposed to alleviate poverty uh, for the elderly. But I've got to say, uh, Dave, you know, when you look at uh, the discourse around pensions in Africa, very rarely is poverty alleviation or the elderly mentioned. Lots of discussion about investment and where the money should go, but not what it should do. I want your assessment on the reasons why that's the case. Well, I think, I think that's because um, a lot of African countries have large informal sectors and the informal sector workers are not you know, um, participating in the pension funds. Um, most of the pension funds are for workers who work in the organized private sector and in government and in large corporations. While the discussion around poverty tends to be focused on those without jobs, those, you know, in the informal sector. I mean, less more is focused on those that, are, that have jobs. I mean, they have jobs, but some of them earn just enough to make a living and living below, uh, maybe just slightly above the poverty line. But I, th I think that micro pension is a way to crowd in these informal sector workers into the pension scheme. However, micro pension to succeed has to be technology driven so that the cost of assessing the pension schemes is very small. And also the participant need to have some money to save. So pension is slightly different from insurance. I think that micro insurance and insurance is more suited to poverty alleviation so that when you have instances like COVID, you can draw on maybe some of those insurance um, policies or benefits that have been accrued over the years. But pension is less so because pension is basically saving for the future. But I think you're right. A lot of pension discussion in Africa is focused on investment and less on poverty alleviation. And we need to begin to change that narrative to talk more about poverty alleviation. Absolutely. It, it's very important. It brings me on nicely to the next question, really, about, uh, you know, the, the, the possibilities of pension funds. It's raging discussion at the moment in southern Africa. But where do you stand in terms of there are some that are saying, you know, don't even do it. Don't invest in the infrastructure in Africa with pension funds. It's just too risky when others, obviously, I, you know, are saying that, you know, this is where it should be. There's potential how do you contend that argument? Well, I think that um, infrastructure has its inherent risk, and what you do in investment is try to de-risk whatever investment it is that you are doing. Um, what we try to do, we invested, was, we are beginning to invest in infrastructure, but more on the debt side. I have to say that we are not taking as much risk because those infrastructure debts are guaranteed. You know, so when you start investment, it's better to invest on the debt side with some guarantee as we lend the asset class and over time we can begin to invest equity to the asset class. We, there are three principal approaches to infrastructure which makes it possible for pension funds to invest. One is greenfield infrastructure on guarantees. Second is brownfield infrastructure issuing debt or, or through a private equity fund. And then the most important and I think interesting are sukuts, which are you know Islamic insurance, Islamic a product issued by the government to finance rules in Nigeria, and then the Green Board, which is the new kid on the block. It's a good discussion to have, uh, but I think that it's possible for pension funds to invest in infrastructure, but in a risk mit mitigated way. And you need to have expertise in the team, and where you don't have the expertise, maybe you outsource the investment to external managers. Absolutely, no risk, no reward. We're running out of time, but I've got to ask you uh, before I go you survived uh, COVID. What are your projections for 2021? Very difficult question because um, I don't know that we have survived the impact of COVID on the economies. Um, I think that 2021 um, will be better than 2020, obviously. It depends for us in Nigeria a lot of what happens to oil prices and the impact, the ability to ramp up on the passive production. Once the global economy is open for business, oil prices, I think, will recover. Um, airlines will start flying, petroleum become. Um, People will start buying gasoline products. And I think Nigeria economy will, will recover slightly, but the debt overhang is significant. And I suspect that next year will still be a difficult year for Nigeria.
Mr. Dave Uduwamos, Managing Director of Sigma Pensions. Thank you so much for joining me on Channel's Business Global. Coming up on Channel's Business Global, I'll be speaking with broadcaster and Africa analyst Tamzan Kijo about the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia. See you after the break. Welcome back to Channel's Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. In a moment, I'll be speaking with Tamzan Kajo about the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia. But before then, here's some company news for you. EasyJet has revealed the first annual loss in its 25-year history of £1.27 billion, a result of the virus crisis turbulence that grounded airlines globally. The no-frills carrier said the total loss before tax figure for the year to the end of September compared to profits of £430 million in the previous 12 months. In an upbeat tone, the company said it had received a 50% leap in bookings following positive coronavirus vaccine developments last week when Pfizer revealed that its candidate had been found to be more than 95% effective in stage three trials. According to a leading union, baggage handler Swissport is making 3,000 employees redundant after refusing to put them on furlough. There was a wave of redundancies ahead of the 31st of October deadline for the furlough scheme, which sees the British government pay 80% of employees' wages. The Chancellor Rishi Shunak belatedly extended the scheme until March, following the announcement of a second lockdown in England. The GMB union claims the Swissport redundancies were announced before the extension and were based on flight scheduling predictions before hopes of a successful vaccine were announced. Shares in tobacco manufacturer Imperial Brands increased by 3.2% to £14.48 after the West Winston and Davidoff Brands owner forecast improved profits for 2021, drawing confidence from expected improvements in its loss-making next-generation products, which include vaping and e-cigarettes. The guidance accompanied news of a rise in annual revenue at Imperial Brands, with consumer demand from tobacco proving resilient during the pandemic and smokers choosing to allocate more of their discretion spend towards tobacco during lockdowns. Now over to our next topic. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, nearly 30,000 people have now fled heavy fighting in Ethiopia to cross into neighbouring Sudan. The country already hosts nearly one million refugees, including those who have fled conflict and poverty in Chad, Eritrea, Central Africa Republic and South Sudan. Ethiopia's embattled Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed warned on Tuesday that a deadline for rebel northern forces to lay down arms had expired, paving the way for a push on the Tigray region's capital in the two-week conflict destabilising the Horn of Africa. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Tamzan Kajo, a broadcaster and Africa analyst. Tamzan Kajo, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on Channel's Business Global. What's going on? The UN have called uh, the situation in Ethiopia that's unfolding right now uh, a serious humanitarian crisis. Well, it is quite a serious, um, not just a humanitarian uh, crisis, um, Juliana, uh, but since you are, you know, the expert of these business shows, it's also a serious uh, business problem because what you are having in the region is that uh, once there's that destabilization that you are seeing from uh, beginning the Tigray region, but, uh, you know, Ethiopia is a fragile federal state. So there are other communities. The Somalis would also be demanding their own sense of power. Uh, the Oromos would be demanding the same. In Amara, that would be uh, something similar. So there's, there are problems that the UN and others are looking at, which is the immediate one with respect to the refugees and people crossing over into Sudan. But when you look at a bigger picture in the context of what's happening, um, it's another case. You know, you're back to Myanmar, a Nobel Prize winner, you know, going, I mean, sending an army into an area within his own borders. That uh, creates problems and instability. Ethiopia would have been you know, the, the, the country that holds that region, the Horn of Africa together, Somalia is having problems, Sudan is having problems, uh, South Sudan is having problems, Eritrea is having its own, um, you know, challenges with um, democracy. So once Ethiopia falls apart, then there are bigger issues that we'll be talking about in years to come than just the refugees crossing over Julia. 
Absolutely. Thank you for making that point, because, of course, we do know that, uh, you know, the, the, the media in the West do like to focus on refugees. And of course, you know, especially here in Britain, that does uh, trigger alarm bells. But can you take it back uh, for us slightly, especially for the viewers who don't understand what's going on? Why is this a crisis? So the, the, the long and short of it is um, from the times that the Ethiopian fought against the, the Italians, there has been, um, you know, conflict uh, for, between one community and the other. Um, so when the emperor uh, Selassie was removed, that uh, came through uh, people who decided to go communist and then socialist under um, um, Mengistu. And then there was a, a long fight uh, in the Tigris where, you know, the center of the military groups that were fighting against Mengistu um, from about 1974, 75 up to 1991. So when Mengistu uh, was deposed, you then had uh, Meles Zenawi coming in, but the core of that where the Tigray forces who then became influential in politics and business, um, as well as the military. So when the, the other communities like the Oromos who, and the Amarabs, who are, you know, the bulk of the populations, the Tigrays are only about 6% of the population in Ethiopia, but they had most of the power. So when Abi Ahmed came in after um, Desalei, the, the, the understanding was he needed to correct that balance, you know, begin to give these other communities some power. So that change of balance, the Tigrays were not happy that they were now losing the influence, losing the power that they had. So they went on to have their original elections, which um, Addis Ababa was saying shouldn't be done because of the COVID-19. And then that began that conflict. And then the federal forces were forced into the Tigray. Um, a region to try and, you know, deal with the leaders, the regional leaders. This is like a state. If you were looking at Nigeria, just think of any state and then that state saying they are going to do their own thing. They don't recognize the government in Abuja anymore. And then the federal force is being sent in there. So that's the long and short of it. It's just the regional government elected by the people in Tigray fighting for what they believe are their own regional autonomous rights against what uh, is happening in Addis Ababa. Because they decided not to be part of Abiy Ahmed's government, although previously they were the core of what held Ethiopia together since 1991. Tamzanka, thank you so much for that thorough analysis. That's uh, really important because I know a lot of people don't know what's uh, really going on. Um, uh, sadly, we are running out of time. Two things I want you to cover in this last question uh, for me. Uh, f firstly, Abiy Ahmed, wow, he has faced a lot of criticism. You know, you throw it back a year, he received the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. I want you to discuss his future. And also the fact that we're in London, you know, I was speaking to you off air saying that, uh, you know, this story is, cover is being covered in The Economist, in The Washington Post, in the BBC, in The Guardian. What, what, what are the West concerned about when it comes to geopolitics? Because uh, typically they, they usually uh, shut up and keep quiet quiet, don't they, when there's um, a, a war in Africa? Well, because um, Ethiopia in particular is, a, is an economic, um, you know, ally to, to the West, especially America, you know, where the development would have been going on. There are other bases in countries like Djibouti, nearby. Um, so, and it's also the gateway to, to that region, to the Horn of Africa, because Somalia is not uh, able to do that. And you don't want to go down as far as Kenya. So Ethiopia is very important for the West uh, from in terms of economics. In terms of Abiy Ahmed himself, uh, there are big, going to be big problems. You know, that massive dam he was building on the Nile, that is going to be under threat if there's no security guarantee in the Tigray. And also, you know, where do you go from here? Once you want a military solution, the criticism is because he wants a military solution rather than a negotiated solution with the Tigray leaders. That is never a winner. They are, these are people who have been fighting for a very long time, and he might not win that war even if he wins the battle. If the soldiers march, march into Mekele, that is not going to be the end of it, I don't think. Tamsen Kisho, broadcaster and Africa analyst. As always, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.